Hello. Uh, good evening, friends. On behalf of the, Dr. Pragnesh Shah, the President of Federation of Family Physicians India, and Dr. Pragnesh Vacharajani, the Honor Secretary of Federation of Family Physicians All India, I welcome you all after a little short gap because last month we had an annual conference at Ahmedabad. Uh, that was the Ahmedabad conference. So we have a, a little gap and we are joining again today. So welcome you all once again. Uh, welcome Dr. Nagraj. We are here today, we, we have here with us Dr. Nagraj from Bangalore, who is going to talk about uh, arthritis, how to approach a patient with arthritis and skin rash. We know that uh, rheumatoid problems are increasing and we have a very big dilemma of how to diagnose, what to, which one to diagnose it for. Uh, though the treatment is mostly uh, disease-modifying drugs and Dr. Nagraj will help us go through all that and uh, looking forward to Dr. Nagraj. He is uh, to introduce Dr. Nagraj in briefly. He's a consultant rheumatologist at uh, Banshankari uh, Trust Rheumatology Arthritis Clinic. And he's a visiting consultant at Sagar Hospital and Columbia Asia or Manipal Yashwantpur. And he has done his MBBS from Ambedkar Medical College, Bangalore, DNB Pediatrics from uh, Mysore Mission Hospital, and fellowship in rheumatology from Mumbai, the Hinduja Hospital. His fellowship in pediatric rheumatology also he has done from Mumbai. So he's got a diverse uh, areas of uh, uh, education. He has more than 30 research publications to his credit. His special interests are lupus, psoriatic arthritis, APLA. He is currently the organization's organizing secretary for the Indian Rheumatology Association Conference of 2024, which will be held in November 24. I request Dr. Nagraj to uh, highlight a few words about that. Uh, he was formerly secretary and joint secretary of Karnataka Rheumatology Association. He, he is at, at present at Banshankari. Over to Dr. Nagraj to enlighten us on how to approach a patient with arthritis and skin rash, which is a common condition we all see. Uh, over to Dr. Nagraj. Yeah, I just take off Dr. Preeti here. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for the kind introduction. I thank the Family Physicians Association of India Federation uh, for giving me this opportunity. And this is a very important uh, uh, topic. And uh, when uh, Madam spoke to me a couple of days back, uh, she thought uh, arthritis and rash would be an appropriate topic rather than any uh, single disease such as lupus or Sjogren uh, syndrome alone, uh, because this will be more common and it will be more which uh, My slides are visible, I suppose. My slides are visible. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, fine. So, uh, so this is the webinar on twelfth uh, March today. I'll try to uh, uh, touch upon briefly on the common rheumatic problems which we encounter. Uh, first, at the outset, I, I will extend a warm welcome from the organizing committee of this uh, Iracon Twenty Four to be held in Bangalore in this November, uh, last week of November at Palace Grounds in Bangalore. Chamar Vajra is the venue. So the theme we have kept it as together in pursuit of excellence. So there'll be an interaction between different different specialists uh, who are uh, uh, having a stake in rheumatology in along with the rheumatologists uh, as the uh, main uh, person. So can you be a little louder, sir? Yes, ma'am. So at the outline, I will uh, want you to uh, uh, understand that uh, this is a disease which is acute, which can be chronic, I want to give a broad understanding of the arthritis, various skin manifestations, the differential diagnosis, and specific rheumatic diseases with skin manifestations. That's how this uh, PPT is uh, presented. So coming to the first one, which is the, uh, sorry, there's some technical glitch. It is struck. The slides are not changing, so. Yeah, slides are not changing. Just a moment.
Right. So the approach, the approach to the joint pains, the four important features what we take down in any history of uh, patient with joint pains is to know whether the joint pains are inflammatory or non-inflammatory. What is the temporal pattern of these pains, whether they're acute, less than six weeks, chronic, more than six weeks. What is the spatial pattern, whether there's primarily a monoarthritis, oligoarthritis, or a polyarticular involvement. And presence of the spine, that is yes, the actual sir. involvement. So your video is one huh? Yes, ma'am. And the, uh, the existence of the extra articular manifestations or the systemic manifestations is uh, what we're actually talking about here. That is the primarily the involvement of the skin in the form of various skin rashes. So the slides are not moving for... Uh... Yeah. Yeah, I think you can visible, yes. So in this uh, uh, PPT, as we can see, whenever a patient comes to us with a patient with complaints of joint pains, be it the larger joints or the smaller joints, what we tend to uh, uh, observe is we tend to take certain important details on this patient. That is the onset of this pain, the progression of the symptoms, the distribution of the disease, whether it's involving the smaller joints, larger joints, on both sides or one side, symmetrical pattern, asymmetrical pattern. We request the patient to describe their complaint. They describe their pain, describe their stiffness, describe this onset of swelling, whether there's any trauma or it's an insider's onset, non-traumatic pain or swelling. And the timing, which is particularly more in the morning hours, and what is the duration of this pain and stiffness in the joints, and what are the aggravating and relieving factors, and any other uh, additional factors such as presence of fever, low grade, or fatigue, and how, how is it impacting their day-to-day -day activities. So these are all the things which you primarily take from a uh, detailed point of view in a musculoskeletal history. That gives us an indication whether the disease is non-inflammatory or inflammatory. The inflammatory having a component of stiffness in the mornings, prolonged morning stiffness, stiffness uh, uh, throughout uh, stiffness and pain, less throughout the day and more at the night and early mornings. By midday or by evening, the patient gets extremely fatigued and would want to take a rest. Previously, an active person would want to take a rest or complete uh, a good one hour of sleep or more than that when they are uh, having this kind of rheumatic disease in the background. Fatigue, lack of sleep, and uh, 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 tiredness and weight loss are one of the characteristic symptoms, symptom complex of rheumatic disease per se. And whenever there is a non-inflammatory condition you are suspecting, the stiffness is usually short-lived. Usually it comes after inactivity. And it is usually a very short duration of stiffness of few minutes, five to 10 minutes only in the morning. And when I mean uh, inflammatory stiffness, it's usually more than 30 to 60 minutes. And typically in a non-inflammatory condition, the pain increases with activity, relieves with rest, which is the contrary to the inflammatory condition where the pains and stiffness appear at rest and disappear uh, with the activity. So this is the inflammatory back pain, which I was talking about. Uh, there are so many criteria given here. We'll focus on the only the first one, which is there on the left side of the panel. That is Callens criteria. In a patient who is less than 40 years of age, when a patient has back pain of more than three months with insider's onset, early morning stiffness, sometimes awakening the patient from sleep. And when the patient gets up and uh, does a bit of walking or exercises, the pain getting relieved. If any of four of these five symptoms... Can you be a little present, louder and closer to the mic, sir? Yes, uh, when you have these kind of symptoms, it indicates that we are having a patient, we are having, we are probably dealing with an inflammatory back pain in this scenario. So this is a typical example of a patient with ankylosing spondylitis, how we fares in the, from in over a period of 24 years, starting from 1947 over here to 1973 in the last uh, uh, photograph was featured here, a straight individual like this due to the inflammatory back pain develops progressive uh, stiffness of the back stoops forward and eventually loses all the movements of the spine, the lumbar, spinal, everything, or a period of 25 years in an untreated patient with ankylosing spondylitis. Uh, a, a simple examination pattern has been proposed called as the GALS examination, wherein the G stands for the gait, A stands for the arms, L for the legs, and S for the spine. So these simple uh, four parameters, they take about one to two minutes in a busy clinic as well. Uh, as the patient walks in, observe the gait, observe the arms, observe the legs, observe the spine as well. This will give a simple clue for us in when a patient is repeatedly complaining of back pain or repeatedly complaining of joint pains, shoulder pain, knee pain, it is better to examine these patients because we, we examine commonly the respiratory system, the 
cardiovascular system, sometimes even the neuro neurological examination uh, we do in our clinic. But uh, many times the musculoskeletal examination is not done on a priority. So that's what I would want you to emphasize over here. That as physicians, as primary care physicians, we should probably uh, look into the musculoskeletal system as well as one of the important uh, modalities of clinical examination in a patient who definitely has some having those complaints as well. There was one good review which has come as, as I was researching for this uh, presentation. This good review came, has come in the Journal of Emergency Medicine about seven years back. It talks about the rash, rashes, the important ones, the dangerous rashes which are important to be uh, distinguished for a more serious cause when they are being evaluated in an ER or the casualty. Uh, because rash is a very common uh, presentation of the skin with a wide range of etiologies. And the differentials can be very broad, consisting of a self-limiting condition to a very serious and life-threatening condition as well. So a thorough history and physical examination and uh, with a particular consideration for the red flags are very, very essential. So the broad four varieties are the petechial or the purpuric rash, erythematous rash, macropapular rash, and the vesiculopulous rash. So these are the, some of the common uh, skin terminologies, the pulla, maculae, the nodule, the patch, the papule, plaque, pustule, vesicle, and the last one is the articarial rash. So coming to the purpuric rash, red flags for this condition is the, uh, for all conditions remain similar, that is the fever, the toxic appearance of the patient, presence of low blood pressure, any mucosal lesions, severe pain associated with the rash, patient being very old or very young, immunosuppressed patient, in an addition of new medicines in the recent past, so when you have a particular rash, we see here the, the maroon colored boxes are all infections, the meningococcemia, the hematological maps such as TTP or the DIC, etc. Fortunately, the autoimmune conditions such as autoimmune vasculitis have been left in, uh, in the white. Similarly, for erythematous rash, again, the, uh, the maroon ones are the toxic abdominal electrolysis or the, the SSSS, the staphylococcal scarlet syndrome or the, uh, the toxic shock syndrome. One important highlighted uh, rheumatic condition is that Kawasaki disease, I want you to note this as a part of the erythematous rash. This occurs in children less than five years of age. In a macular popular rash, macular popular rash, macular papules, uh, they have both a uh, combination of the macules as well as the papules. Again, the infections become more common here. The measles, the Lyme disease, the Steven Johnson syndrome, erythema multiforme, meningococcal, and in specific parts of the world, the Lyme disease, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, etc. Uh, fortunately, again, we have the psoriasis and other uh, etiologies in a white background. The vesiculobullous rash, uh, again, uh, the herpes is very important uh, condition here. We see very commonly in rheumatic patients, particularly with those with Jack inhibitors, etc. I'll come to that in a minute later. Now, combining these two, that is the arthritis and rash. We had a brief introduction to the arthritis and its per se, and then the uh, skin manifestations, uh, the various skin rash types and their uh, red flags. Now, when both are present, when a patient has skin manifestations which are recurrent over a long period, associated with rheumatic complaints such as the joint pains, joint swelling, and joint stiffness, that might lead to a new rheumatological diagnosis altogether, or it may occur in a patient with this who in whom already a diagnosis of rheumatic disease is already made. For example, a patient is already a patient of lupus who is on treatment with a, a rheumatologist, sometimes comes into walk a walks into a family physician's clinic, stating that some have got some skin rash. Now, in the background of lupus, in the background of the immunosuppressive medicines, we should be very carefully evaluating these patients to look for any opportunistic infection or a flare-up lupus or both. So a timely diagnosis and timely referral can really help this patient to avoid particular morbidity due to these outcomes. I'll start with the psoriatic arthritis in specific conditions because psoriasis typically is considered as a skin disease. And uh, it is one of the, uh, the spondyloarthropodes group of spectrum of disorders. And it is, it is closely linked with the HLA-B donation. About 40% patients with psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis having a positive HLA-B donation. Anglosin spondylitis patients have a higher uh, percentage of up to 80 to 90%. Whereas psoriasis patients and psoriatic arthritis patients have a lesser percentage of up to 30-40%. Those are the typical areas of the psoriatic uh, nail involvement. I mean, the skin involvement, the elbows, the uh, knee joints, typical nail changes in the form of pitting and nail dystrophy. Presence of dactylitis, as you can see in the second panel of this uh, this photo here, this is the presence of typical dactylitis, which can be seen. And the enthesitis, that is involvement of the uh, heels or any area wherein the uh, ligaments gets inserted to the bones, that's the area which is called as enthesis. And, in the, uh, enthesis. and the involvement of the enthesis and the inflammation of the enthesis is called as the inflammatory enthesitis. It can happen in this Achilles, uh, Achilles region or it can happen in the 
gluteal degenerate can happen in the any area commonly for, for example in the back upper back and all there are specific scoring systems for enthesitis scoring as well these are the typical deformities due to psoriatic arthritis in a patient who is severely affected again showing another picture of uh, dactylitis the right second uh, uh, finger that is the uh, the middle finger and in a uh, in a primary physician clinic how to uh, pick up a case of psoriatic arthritis there are certain set of questions which can be easily passed off do you have had any skin rash in the past have you had any changes in your skin nails have you seen any doctor in the skin rash repeatedly in the past or have yes, have been diagnosed with psoriasis in the past and you are now having any uh, remission now you are not having any psoriasis lesions previously somebody told you a dermatologist told you that you had a psoriasis do you have any joint stiffness joint pain any swollen joints do you have any swollen finger do you have any neck pain low back pain now you have any skin rash these kind of questions about 12 of them when they have when the patient gives yes or no type of answers and a score of more than 8 out of 12 questions this can be easily asked as a practice in our busy clinics and that can pick up a patient of psoriasis uh, psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis because you should know that up to 40 to 75% of patients with psoriasis can go on to develop psoriatic arthritis and it is one of the condition which is not uh, uh, diagnosed commonly and uh, nearly half of the patients are not recognized as per the studies uh, very recently till about a decade or uh, one of decades back so it is important for us to understand psoriasis patients do have psoriatic arthritis they can have psoriatic spondylitis in the form of back pain they can have peripheral arthritis as well now come to the common condition which is the rheumatoid arthritis the rheumatoid arthritis is we all know it is a symmetrical uh, arthritis involving predominantly the upper limb joints and the small joints and uh, large joints both the the fortunately the skin conditions are less in rheumatoid arthritis we have rheumatoid nodules as seen in this picture as seen is shown in this picture in presence in the rheumatoid nodules in the elbow regions accelerated nodulosis which can happen in the fingers etc rheumatoid vasculitis as as you can be seen in the lower panel of this figure here felty syndrome fortunately is rare it was described in 1924 as uh, uh, as uh, uh, complication of rheumatoid fortunately with well controlled rheumatoid this complication is coming down recently pyroma congenital sometimes can occur as part of the uh, uh, chronic untreated or uh, improperly uh, irregularly treated rheumatoid arthritis either due to neglect or due to uh, cross pathies etc various other reasons now this is one of the uh, uh, problems we are encountering of late this is a very uh, very florid herpes uh, region which is being seen here and this complication in a patient of rheumatoid uh, came out because of the uh, inadequate screening and uh, properly imp improper dosing and uh, 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 improper dosing of the jack inhibitors such as the trofastinib or the baricitinib in this patients without doing adequate check without uh, vaccination this patient probably went on trofastinib and uh, developed uh, herpes zoster herpes zoster is a very well known uh, complication of trofastinib but in a well uh, uh, measured patient in well uh, when it's used in tailored doses probably the incidence is much much lesser the hazard ratio is about 4% uh, for uh, four times more in all trofastinib doses as compared to the normal patients without uh, trofastinib use next condition is the lupus lupus by protrap is the most common and well known uh, connective tissue disease there have been various descriptions of lupus in fact the uh, lupus descriptions are predominantly of the skin nature the dermatologist practitioners uh, described predominantly the erythema centrifuge in uh, 1838 and then the lupus erythematosus 1851 it was labeled as lupus erythematosus in 1860 and only later in uh, late uh, 19th century that it became the systemic nature of the disease was appreciated by the kaposi by mr uh, kaposi uh, moritz kaposi in late 19th century uh, initially before late 19th century the disease was considered predominantly as a skin disease so that's how this uh, lupus erythematosus has a very uh, strong uh, presence of uh, skin manifestations in all the uh, classification criteria which have been evolved over a period of uh, last 4 uh, 5 uh, decades from 1960s 70s so that some of the typical uh, manifestations of lupus are the butterfly rash which you all know here as you can see here the butterfly rash on the face typically it spaces the nasal bridge uh, they space the nasal labial folds it uh, it spreads over the nasal bridge and it uh, it, uh, it spaces the nasal labial folds that's a distribution point from the the rash uh, similarly seen in a patient with dermatomyositis as well and the sec the right panel is showing what is known as a lupus timidus this is a chronic lupus erythematosus condition 
and uh, this uh, this is uh, seen in a patient with uh, CLD or the uh, uh, chronic uh, it's clearance lupus uh, for most patients and that patient can may or may not go on to have uh, systemic manifestations at a later point of time dl the red scaly patches uh, which with will which will heal uh, with atrophy and uh, depigmentation and the scar are uh, are very common they usually present over the face or the upper back and the etc and uh, they are very characteristic of uh, lupus and a very catastrophic of the clinical lupus cl manifestations uh, sle being a multi system disease there is no organ which is spared by lupus therefore vascular lesions in the form of vasculitis is also very very common in lupus in fact one third of one third of lupus patients may have may have one one or the other form of vasculitis including uh, the this type of the lupus reticularis seen here vasculitic skin lesions on the feet here renards phenomenon periangual uh, lesions palmar erythema lupus reticularis uh, stomophlebitis chronic ulcers peripheral gangrenes these are all some of the well described uh, manifestations of lupus so the lupus uh, cutaneous manifest can be classified based on the timing as the acute subacute and the chronic and this is the spectrum as we can see here the cutaneous chronic cutaneous lupus lupus lesions can sometimes be staying separate and they may or may not develop uh, systemic manifestations sometimes if they are treated with hydroxychloroquine or adequate immunomodulators by the dermatologist sometimes there is a overlap usually the acute cutaneous lupus patients have a huge overlap with the systemic lupus patients and the chronic ones the classical daily ones a small percentage of them can go on to develop systemic manifestations majority of them can remain without any uh, systemic manifestations presenting only with the skin manifestations so these patients when they are uh, coming to uh, our family physicians clinic it is important to identify them look into the diagnosis uh, written by the dermatologists counsel them not to leave treatment not to discontinue treatment because they are well now because it may uh lead to progression of the disease uh, to the systemic uh, uh, involvement if the patient discontinues the treatment so we lost you we are not able to hear you now ma'am ah uh, now you can hear yes ma'am one slide back now ma'am yes sir we can hear you yeah so the dermatomyositis is a very important uh, uh, condition it's a bit rare condition but still very rewarding when it's picked up early this are the classical uh, and very uh, specific uh, and highly pathognomonic skin manifestations of dermatomyositis uh, these are called as the gotrans papules which are multiple hyperkeratotic uh, red papules over the presence over presence on the the pap joints and the mcp joints and the presence of these kind of mechanics hands which again indicates the hyperkeratosis of the ulnar aspect of the index fingers and thumb fingers etc and uh, there is sometimes a discomation it can be present in both hands uh, so it is these are uh, 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 mechanic sense is somewhat non specific whereas the gotten papules is very specific as i was describing here when you compare a patient of uh, uh, lupus compared to uh, dermatomyositis as you can see there is involvement of the facial rash without uh, sparing the Uh, the nasolabial folds as can be seen in the lupus which has spared the rash here has not involved the nasolabial folds whereas in the dermatomyositis the rash is uh, continuous and it is a mask like pattern uh, similarly the the v shaped distribution of the uh, rash over the upper neck is a very characteristic feature of the uh, dermatomyositis and as compared to the cutaneous lupus it can be more widespread and uh, without any uh, particular pattern such as inverted v So, if we look at the uh, spectrum of the dermatomyositis and the polymyositis, some of them can have only muscle involvement, a portion of them can have only skin involvement without the uh, muscle involvement. We have a set of autoantibodies uh, called as the myositis associated and autoantibodies and the myositis specific autoantibodies. These are usually done in consultation with the rheumatologist because they are quite expensive and the interpretation also needs some expertise. Next is the scleroderma. Scleroderma is a very uh, uh, difficult condition. it's a very progressive condition and it's fatal because of the lung involvement and presence of the uh, ph on heart involvement the skin uh, the skin involvement is very characteristic that's why the name itself is called as this scleroderma or the systemic sclerosis and joint involvement is also minimal and ga involvement is very drastic in these patients this is a typical uh, child with uh, systemic sclerosis she's around 21 years old with uh, developmental uh, with a severe weight loss and uh, weakness as you can see she has got typical scleroderma facies difficulty in opening of the mouth and skin uh, tightening etc 
But scoring systems such as this, uh, wherein the, the typical normal uh, pinchability of the skin is like that, whereas the, the skin thickness leads to difficulty in uh, uh, pinching the skin, it's mild thickening, moderate thickening to severe thickening. This can be done in specified areas, and there's a scoring system for the modified Rodman score for this, which is usually done in the research clinics. The other vasculitis, which is uh, probably the most common vasculitis uh, in children at least, is the is the Hanoxonin purpura. Now, the current vasculitis, current name is the IgA vasculitis because of the presence of the abnormal IgA deposits on the vessel wall of these uh, patients, uh, of these skin lesions. That's why it's called as IgA vasculitis. These are the typical uh, uh, skin lesions, the classic involvement of the buttocks and the lower limbs and presence of necrotic lesions in these patients. And uh, they have typically uh, sparing of the upper limbs, predominant involvement of the buttocks and the lower limbs. This is the very characteristic of HSP. And 20 to 60 percent of children with HSP can go on to have renal involvement. In fact, that is a real concern because the rash, though it is very uh, angry looking and very extensive, it usually recedes without dissolves without any problem. On the other hand, the renal involvement is more serious and it can probably uh, lead to even uh, CKD in about 2 to 15 percent patients and in state renal disease in less than 1 percent patients requiring renal replacement therapy. So one should watch for the, uh, the proteinuria here. And uh, there's a uh, pathway here, as we can see here. This pathway wherein the patient has presented uh, to with HSP. And if the patient doesn't have proteinuria in the uh, beginning, the patient will go on to have every monthly review or every three monthly review and then every six months. And rather, if the patient has a proteinuria in the, in the set of diagnosis, the patient goes on to have a monthly review with the uh, rheumatologist. And then uh, even after six months, if the condition is stable, the patient has to be under primary care pediatrician. The other complications are the urogenital uh, complications, CNS and lungs and the of course, the J normal in the form of the intersusception is very common uh, in up to 1 to 5 percent patients. Uh, ILO ileal uh, variety is more common here in uh, these patients with uh, HSP. When the patient has severe abdominal pain, these patients should warrant an abdominal scan uh, under the abdomen to look for the intersusception in patients with uh, enoxonolin. Kawasaki disease, uh, in, a, in fact, a rheumatological emergency and one of the very, uh, it's a medium vessel vasculitis seen typically in children under 5 years of age. A very cranky child, as you can see here, the presence of uh, uh, pharyngeal redness, dry fissured lips, injected lips, uh, and a very uh, bright strawberry tongue, and presence of this uh, edema of this hands, I mean the feet and the the dorsum of the hands, all these areas, peripheral edema, and the discomation, the yeah, the presence of, of activity in the BCG scar area, they're all very characteristic of presence of uh, uh, Kawasaki disease. The Kawasaki disease is a clinical diagnosis you must remember and the treatment involves the intravenous uh, intra, I mean, immunoglobulin. IVAG is the first line of treatment uh, and not steroids here and that can be life-saving. As I told you in uh, Kawasaki disease, it is the presence of the, it's the presence and development of the coronary aneurysms later in the past, uh, later in the disease course that is more fatal and these patients can have sudden cardiac death if untreated and unpicked up. So they need a serial cardiac uh, pediatric cardiology monitoring. Uh, uh, though the resolve, there is a resolution of the the skin manifestations over a period of time. Finally, coming to the panniculitis, this can be any spectrum of uh, such as the erythema nodosum, or it can be very ugly in the, as far as neutrophilic dermatosis, such as the pyoderma gangrenosum. In this condition, this can be a background of autoimmune disease any sort. It can be even rheumatoid arthritis, or it can be a vasculitis. As you can see, the different diagnosis of erythema nodosum is very very vast. Most of the systemic diseases are like, you know, uh, rheumatic diseases. But one should also remember the presence of malignancies and sometimes presence of any infections or any drug induced, such as, uh, as a host of uh, antibiotics and ACE inhibitors, antihypertensives, etc. So the treatment this is more or less uh, uh, broad uh, anti inflammatory treatment for uh, ethymonodosum, colchicine, dapsone, hydroxychloroquine, interlational steroids, a TNF inhibitors in select cases. Whenever you suspect a patient uh, of uh, uh, when a patient with suspected connective disease, disease CTD presents with uh, rashes, these patients should be evaluated with a proper basic hematological blood test. A low uh, uh, anemia of chronic inflammation should be looked for. Presence of acute phase reactants, inflammatory markers such as ESR at the CRP. They were initially called as acute phase reactants because they should be present in acute inflammation. In a patient with chronic inflammation, they continue to be present. However, they need not be high in all the patients. One should be uh, very cautious in interpreting the high ESR or the low ESR. And it's the clinical examination and the clinical features which matter the most rather than a presence of a particular autoantibody or a presence of uh, 
uh, inflammatory marker. So initial tests for arthritis is usually rheumatoid factor or ANA by immunofluorescence. One should always keep the pre-test probability in mind when we are doing a test for uh, uh, any rheumatological blood test. And we should request through appropriate methods because uh, sometimes this can lead to, uh, this can rather mislead us to a negative test and we can th we think that there is no arthritis in this patient, there is no presence of connective tissue disease in this patient because the tests are negative. For example, ANA by immunofluorescence is highly sensitive and can yield a very good result. Whereas just writing it as ANA without mentioning the method can sometimes uh, they can be left to the interpretation of the lab technician and uh, it may lead to a misinterpretation of the result and very because ANA by ELASA, etc. And it may be it may be non-specific and it may come as negative and one, one will stop uh, pursuing it further rather than uh, doing additional testing or doing a detailed clinical examination and the history. So quantitative techniques are uh, preferable whenever they are available. And biopsy from the skin lesions is vital and we should keep the, the dermatoids in the loop and we should be in constant touch with them. And whenever there is a biopsy feasible from the lesions, whenever the dermatologists also feel that a biopsy is required, especially in uh, conditions such as the erythema nodosum or the pyedoma gangnosum, it is important for us to uh, do the biopsy, interpret it in the background of the biopsy, and then plan the treatment. So, uh, uh, replication of the slide here. Whenever there was repeated skin manifestations or long period in a background of rheumatic complaints, that may add to, so sometimes these patients don't think that the rheumatic complaints are related to the skin rash which is coming. So as family physicians, when we are looking at them, previously this patient came to me with joint complaints. Now this patient has come to me with some uh, skin conditions. So probably are the both skin and the rheumatic complaints, are they linked? Are they due to the same etiology? Sometimes by thinking and linking these kind of conditions, we may actually give them a new rheumatological diagnosis. And if there's a patient who is already diagnosed, with this kind of presentation may alert us to, to look for any flare of the underlying disease or a presence of infection, which should be appropriately treated by the right uh, drugs such as the antibiotics or the uh, increase in the immunosuppressants, as as the case may be. So managing a patient is uh, may, it's, it's usually it's a very tedious process. Patient has a lot of uh, concerns and a lot of um, uh, anxiety, so it needs adequate counseling. Uh, it, uh, it's very important as many times the family physicians helps us to, as the anchor of these uh, family physicians and internists will help us the anchor as the, as the anchor of the patient. They will keep the rheumatologists, the dermatologists, ID specialists or the church physicians or the nephrologists or any other uh, specialist involved such as the cardiologists in uh, Kawasaki. So uh, we have to explain the risk involved, sometimes the complications which may be developing. It can be an initial manifestation. If it is self-manifesting, self-limiting, well and good. If it is in harboring, if it is harboring some other uh, uh, serious manifestation that should be told to the patient and that, that should be clearly explained. A detailed workup is necessary because infections are very common. As we know, infection workup should be done in the in a proper and systematic manner. And then one should take uh, into consideration the workup for the immunological diseases as specified in the past. Of course, we should look into the uh, aspect of uh, concomitant uh, drug uses, especially the alternative forms of treatment. They are also very important. And it's particularly common in our country. Patients tend to use uh, the allopathy medicines in combination without being... Uh, without sharing those details with the, their primary care physicians or the rheumatologists on the advice of some friends or the social media or internet or uh, some TV ads, etc. Thinking that so sometimes these cross interactions can be really harmful and they're actually unknown, the drug interactions in those scenarios. So these things also should be kept in mind and uh, detailed history is very important. So this is a, a typical, uh, I want to give this example because uh, this kind of free field placement, see there are 11 players in a cricket uh, team. As you can see here, there is a bowler and there is the uh, wicket keeper. Rest of uh, the nine other players are positioned in a single line like this. It seems this kind of uh, field setting was done on two occasions by the Australian team captains in 1977 and 1999. And it was uh, to get out this one important player. So why I put this uh, 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 slide is, because our rheumatic conditions always are the last in the, the last in the, uh, uh, thinking. We always think of the uh, infections first. We think of uh, the malignancies next and then other uh, cardi other, other systemic uh, uh, diseases. Rheumatic diseases come as most of, most of the diseases of exclusion. But it's important for us to really trap the last batsman uh, so that the match doesn't end in a drop. There should be a clear result out of it. That's what's my idea of this one because the, the idea of uh, you know, uh, putting the slide is to look for the even the final uh, clue don't uh, leave any uh, clue or any disease without any uh, uh, test or any 
consultation left uh, without being done. So with this, I would like to end my presentation. Before that, I would want to draw your attention to our uh, conference, which is happening in this uh, November in Bangalore at Chamarabhajar Palace Grounds. This November 21st, 24th, there is a, there going to be a CME for uh, uh, physicians, orthopedic surgeons, and all the allied specialties. There'll be one day, half day dedicated CME for this on this one of these four days. We'll come out with a detailed program. I'll share it with you on the relevant groups. We also have a website uh, that's irakan 24 uh, bangalore24.com uh, all those details will be shared to you and we'll also be giving the adequate appropriate details from time to time about the registration and other uh, details anyway thank you for having me i thank the family physician uh, uh, the federation of the family physicians of Association of india particular preeti shankar madam uh, for having uh, uh, me involved in, the, uh, in this series of uh, lectures from the uh, subspecialities as an aid to the family physician practice thanks a lot thank you very much sir Thank you for an excellent presentation, quite a detailed one. Though management is very complex, so I think you've not touched upon it much. And uh, so, management is a uh, very individualized man. management, is not yeah. uniform. That's why I left it. I showed in the state of that erythema nodosum was uh, taken as an example. But as you can see, even in one particular condition, there are so many drugs involved. Similarly, in lupus, it changes. In systemic sclerosis, it changes. In rheumatoid arthritis, it changes. So basically, as you, you, you made a very right remark in the beginning, the disease control, that is by the appropriate use of the disease modifying anti rheumatic DMARDs, remains the mainstay. That is the point I want to drive again. These things will be treated symptomatically as and when it is necessary. Are there some common side effects to all of the uh, disease modifying drugs? Uh, you mean the skin manifestations, ma'am? No, no, and side effects of all the drugs in common. Correct, correct. So we have to have a uh, watch on these uh, uh, DMARDs whenever we are increasing the doses, whenever you are uh, decreasing the doses. Usually we keep doing tests every uh, two to three months, sometimes in a stable patient every four months uh, to look for the variations in the liver tests or the uh, kidney tests and any uh, drop in hemoglobin, any hematological toxicity like... Uh, leukopenia or uh, myelo, myelo suppression, etc. Basically, we're looking for that. So we keep doing that. And in the doses, what we use, uh, usually the such side effects are usually very well managed. And whenever we suspect them at the earliest, any withdrawal of the drug and can uh, usually result in a normalcy of the uh, condition. Okay. So there are questions on the YouTube channel. Yes, uh, Can tofacitinib be given lifelong for rheumatoid arthritis? Tofacitinib is a, uh, uh, as per the guidelines, it is actually the third level medicine, the primary level medicines uh, still remain the methotrexate as the anchor drug, followed by hydroxychloroquine, sulfasalazine, leflunamide. These are the other second level of drugs. In the third stage, uh, along with the biologicals, tofacinib has been given the, is given the place. So whenever the patient is on tofacinib, it means that the patient has a uh, quite an uh, quite a aggressive disease and he needs a combination therapy. There are also now uh, people who are talking about the tofacinib monotherapies. But tofacinib has a lot of uh, complications. It needs a thorough screening for uh, COX, uh, tuberculosis, HIV, HBC, G serology, and uh, so, and uh, the TB. We do the chest X-ray, the Manto test. Everything has to be done. And uh, nowadays uh, uh, there are recommendations to use uh, uh, the herpes shingles vaccine, Shingrix from the GSK. Uh, that's the only vaccine available as of now in India. So that vaccination has also been recommended uh, in patients who are at, uh, supposed to be at risk for. Uh, Herpes and uh, initiation of the uh, tofacinib in appropriate doses. Whether it's lifelong, it's debatable because whenever a patient achieves remission, one should uh, we we stop uh, we stop uh, using a combination therapy in such patients. We start uh, tapering the doses. If there are a patient is using three DMARDs, we start taking off one one DMARD uh, one by one every three months or six months or a year or so, depending on the patient's disease control. So tofacinib is one of the medicines which usually taken off the first. Because uh, the, the, the longest data and the longest safety records are available still with the methotrexate group of medicines, the, the conventional demands they are called as. So they remain the, our long-term stay. When a patient achieves remission with tofacinib, we tend to withdraw as early as possible, let's say in about six months to one year or uh, maybe two years. But uh, it's difficult to say because it's only less than 12 years since we have used this medicine now. It's only licensed in 2012. Whether a patient requests it lifelong, that question will be really difficult to answer at this point of time. I think that answers your question, Dr. Khan. Uh, Dr. Shobha is asking a question. There is a 39-year-old anchor positive, uh, ESR 50, bilateral wrist joint pain, mid-arm pain, and um, 
metacarpal joint pain in hands. Mother known I think mother known rheumatoid arthritis. How to go about? Yes. So, uh, uh, so in this patient, as we can see here, this is a very good case Madam has presented. So, we have a, a background of a, uh, genetic background of uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Mother has been uh, rheumatoid arthritis. And the patient seems to have a wrist involvement in the form of inflammatory arthritis. Now, we have an uh, abnormal ESR, but uh, we have, a, I don't know what is the indication to do ANCA. No, ANCA, uh, so. Yes, we don't have details such as rheumatoid factor or ANA. We don't have anti CCP because if mother has rheumatoid arthritis and if the doctor is having, uh, if this patient is having, uh, symptoms or signs suggestive of rheumatoid arthritis, uh, we should be more concentrating on rheumatoid factor, anti-CCP, high ESR. If ANCA positivity sometimes can be, uh, we don't know the pattern, we don't know, as I told you, the ANCA can be of two patterns, the P-ANCA, the C-ANCA. C-ANCA are more specific towards vasculitis, whereas P-ANCA can be non-specific. That's why, as I told you in one of my present, one of the slides, we should choose our test, what we are doing. Here, the positivity definitely indicates at least the presence of clear wrist involvement, wrist synovitis is very uh, uh, important sign for us to start this patient on uh, appropriate DMAR therapy. Maybe I would start with on this patient on uh, hydroxychloroquine to begin with, wait for a couple of weeks, and then uh, go on to add methotrexate uh, starting from about 7.5 mg or 5 mg per week, and then uh, wait for this combination to help for about two to three months, and then go then go on adding or increase the doses or adding additional disease modifying drugs depending on the requirement. But for the symptomatic control, we, this patient might require a good course of NSAIDs or even a steroid if there is no contraindication, such as diabetes. Thank you, sir. And uh, Dr. Maimo, just uh, appreciating your talk a lot. You covered almost the entire rheumatology with skin rashes. And he's also asking the role of anti-CCP and the role of anti-DSDNA. Yes. The anti-CCP, as I was mentioning, is a very specific test for rheumatoid arthritis. So whenever, uh, usually when a patient has a good titer of rheumatoid factor positivity. You can you stop say, sharing the slides so we can all see you better. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so what I was telling was if a rheumatoid factor is positive in a high titer, such as more than the three times the upper limit of normal, where uh, the cutoff is, let's say, 14 or 15 or 20, if the patient has a rheumatoid factor of 60 or 100, Usually, we don't uh, do anti-CCP for these patients if they have any, or if they are doing, having any other, uh, all the proper signs and symptoms of rheumatoid arthritis, typical symmetrical pattern, etc. But anti-CCP is more helpful in a condition where rheumatoid factor is negative. Anti-CCP is an expensive test, much more expensive, and that should be done uh, by appropriate laboratories. There are, uh, the, now we have third generation anti-CCP, uh, which is there. So we have to order an appropriate method and once it is positive, it is uh, supposed to be very characteristic and specific for rheumatoid arthritis. And one should not repeat these tests. One should not repeat any anti-CCP or rheumatoid factor or ANA or ANCA. Any of these specific immunological tests should not be repeated unless there is indication of a disease uh, changing its course, developing more complications. And usually such things happen once in after once in five, six or ten years. So there are instances where we have not have repeated a rheumatoid factor for at least 10 years. We don't do the rheumatoid, we don't do say, you know, consequent tests to see whether rheumatoid factor title is decreasing or increasing, anticipated is reducing or increasing, because those things will not have any implications for our treatment. As we all know, 30% of the patients with rheumatoid arthritis can be seronegative. They are neither having rheumatoid factor, they can they need not have anti-CCP. They are negative for both. They are negative for anti-CCP also. We do still treat them as seronegative rheumatoid arthritis, isn't it? So keeping that in view, we end up treating the uh, the symptoms and signs or, and the response to the disease modifying drugs itself is a proof of the uh, condition. So these autoantibodies will help us the initial diagnosis only. We will not. They will not be helpful for us to monitor the treatment. For monitoring the treatment, we only require the liver function test, the renal function test, the complete blood count, ESR, CRP, those kind of uh, tests. And the other yeah. point uh, which uh, Sarah has asked is uh, the uh, uh, second anti -DNA. point. Anti-DSDNA. Yeah. Anti-DSDNA is uh, more useful in a background of lupus. The, it's one of the autoantibodies uh, in that ANA profile which I was mentioning. Anti-DSDNA is done by two methods. The Chrysidia uh, uh, Lucilia method is the Chrysidia Lucilia method is supposed to be highly specific. It's uh, done by immunofluorescence. If that is available, that should be requested first. Or else by ELISA. 
uh, anti-dystonia is a test which indicates certain uh, involvement such as the renal involvement, neuropsychiatric lupus, etc. Particularly, the renal involvement is very common. So, we do in a patient in a in a, in a background of ANA immunofluorescence positivity. Then we do this test anti-dystonia whenever the patient is having complications such as the nephrological uh, renal involvement in a patient of lupus. Otherwise, it's uh, directly not to be requested as a first line test. How do you treat anemia in rheumatoid arthritis and rheumatoid without skin involvement? Can tofacinamide be given? Yes. The anemia in uh, rheumatoid arthritis is, as I told you, anemia. This, this comes under the anemia of the chronic inflammation. So when we look at the, the complete blood count of these patients, we look into their uh, the, uh, the MCV. The MCV gives us indication whether the patient also has an uh, ongoing uh, iron deficiency as well. So we have to have any nutritional parameters, which is also contributing to the anemia. Whether the patient can have poor intake because of the rheumatoid, uh, rheumatoid, rheumatoid arthritis itself. Because rheumatoid arthritis itself can have uh, lack, of appetite, lack of appetite, lack of sleep, fatigue, and all those things. So improving the patient's appetite by good disease control. Giving appropriate iron supplements when there is a concomitant iron deficiency as well. Ultimately, a good disease control, a good control of arthritis can help them to improve uh, uh, iron and hemoglobin. Many times we don't supplement them with iron or any other uh, uh, supplements uh, when the hemoglobin is around uh, 10 or more. Only when the hemoglobin is less than 10, we should be cautious and we do use supplements. And one more cautious factor is uh, these JAK inhibitors also have a role Physiologically, that means even in our uh, normal day-to-day, uh, uh, -day, uh, in a healthy human being, this jack, uh, uh, jack, uh, that pathway is involved in erythropoiesis. Therefore, when you use these jack inhibitors, that may interfere with uh, uh, erythropoiesis. So one should not use uh, jack inhibitors when the hemoglobin is less than ten ideally. So, uh, uh, so in a patient, that question ask, answer, answer that question specifically. When a patient does not have skin manifestations, yes, we can use tofacinib. Uh, 5 mg uh, uh, as a starting dose, and we can use it uh, till the remission is achieved. Need skin infested involvement or uh, no? As, uh, without skin involvement, that can be used. Any other questions, ma'am? Any zero? So, are there case of zero negative RA going on to need biological drugs, Doctor Jay Prakash? Yes. The presence of autoantibodies such as rheumatoid factor or anti-CCP are con considered as the poor prognostic factors. They tell us that the patient might have more erosions of their uh, uh, bones. There can be more erosions in the joints. The patient can have more aggressive course. The patient may, have, may need a combination DMAR therapy is what they indicate. They are considered as the prognostic factors. But as we discussed in the few minutes back, when these autoantibodies are negative, we still treat them as zero negative arthritis, zero negative rheumatoid arthritis. And uh, sometimes even zero negative arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis patients can have a very resistant course. They may need a combination of disease modifying drugs, including biologicals, including the targeted synthetic demodulus that, that, that group consists of the jack inhibitors at, at the present. So we tend to use the conventional DMARs, the TS DMARs, as well as the biological DMARs. The, the combination of the TNF inhibitors, rituximab, etc., depending on the uh, need. The rituximab is not commonly used in seronegative rheumatoid. It's more commonly used in seropositive rheumatoid arthritis patients. But we tend to use the TNF-alpha inhibitors such as the adalimumab, infliximab, or the etanercept in these patients whenever there is a need, whenever they are not controlled adequately with the combination of conventional DMARs and TSDMARs. That's it, sir. There are not any more questions. Yes, ma'am. Someone in the WhatsApp group has asked me about monoclonal antibodies, mm -hmm. not on YouTube. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for an excellent mm -hmm. presentation. There are a lot of comments and appreciations in the YouTube channel also. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, uh, the, the, that question was, he has not touched upon monoclonal antibodies. Yes. That's what he has written. Yeah, as I told you, it's uh, uh, condition specific and it's, there's no uniform uh, monoclonal antibody for uh, all these conditions. Okay, fine. So I think Dr. Surendra, he has answered your question. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you very much for taking the interactive session also through very nicely, very explicitly. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Rahul. 
and last but not the least on behalf of the president and secretary of federation of family physicians association of india myself dr preeti shankar thank all your uh, energetic and very enthusiastic audience all of you for participating in the interactive session thank you all very much thank you dear. thank you sir thank you rahul can end the program thank you rahul